So first of all, I'm really nervous. I hope you, you don't seem. I would like to thank organizers uh, for this wonderful event. Uh, and also uh, thank the institution for the organization. And I think it's very nice and well organized here. So as I see that I have my talk after the lunch, I know how it is with attention. So I try to make it uh, as it's like easy and understandable for you. So in the end, I hope everything, everybody would understand that this topic is kind of easy, kind of nice, and kind of useful. So uh, I would like to start from the very, very easy beginning. Uh, Sobolev embedding, everybody knows. Then we have what is called Galliardo Nirnberg, which is much more scary, but still kind of well known. And this is the like the what we could call call Galliano Nirnberg. And then we have uh, if we combine these two results in some kind of uh, interpolation, we can get such a such a nice result with so many letters that uh, when you see for the first time, you would get scared. And I will try to persuade you not to get scared. Uh, first, I use colors, which is always friendly. So this theta means the interpolation work. Then uh, we have the red letters, which represent like the Sobolev spaces that we use. And then we put this theta between j over k and 1. If you put 1 and made some simple calculation, you would get this Sobolev case. And if you put j over k, you would get exactly the, this result. Uh, I am sorry for the people who are too familiar with this because I will start with some kind of philosophical start. If we take the simplest case, here is some theta one minus theta. Don't bother with the space yet. The Sobolev case is kind of, you control the function by its change. It's super logical. But now you control the change by the change of change and the function itself. So first from the geometrical point of view, you, you would say, okay, this term is helping me, but how come it's helping me because in general, I cannot control the change by the function itself. So I was thinking how to explain without using like uh, too many letters. Imagine you have a car and you want to test how fast the car can go. And you are limited by acceleration. How you would get the, your maximum speed? You will go. You will just speed and go as fast as possible. And then you will see that the change of your position is controlled by the acceleration somehow. It's pretty clear. But then imagine that you have some limitation and then you know that your position is somehow controlled. For simplicity, by a maximum. You have some distance from the very beginning, you can go. You cannot go any longer than this. How would you test the maximum speed you can achieve? What would you go? I will let you, let you like come with this. How would you test your maximum if you cannot go further than this? So this is your area. You have some limited acceleration and how you would reach the maximum speed in this area. Pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see. <laughs> you will start to go around. So your speed would be in this way and what you need with your acceleration. If you are riding not car but bike, you would have to use your acceleration 
in this way to speed up, but also in this way to not to leave your area. So then you see that if you have some limitation by your distance to some alpha in beta, you would get much more restricted than if you are speeding just one direction. So it's kind of geometrically clear that if you have limitation from the function itself, you would get much more better control over your first derivative. I hope this idea is a little bit clear. So it's not that crazy for this formula to exist. I don't put there the restriction. In general, j is smaller than k because uh, otherwise it, it would be like pretty simple. And I would make my example even a little bit crazier because this is like two dimensional and you can like imagine, but let's put it to the one dimension. So if you construct the counter example or like twice man set this morning, if you want to have optimal theorem, you start with counter example. And if you do the best counter example, you would see what you want to prove. So if you want to check how the, how the Sobolev embedding goes, use the maximal acceleration and you just go up to the singularity as much as you can. But here, as you go around, if we want to construct something in one dimension, let's have it. What you would do if you go around and you want to simulate it in one dimension, it's pretty clear what you have to do. Some kind of sign. And this is actually the a uh, good counterexample for almost all version of Galeardo Nirmet. Why? Where you have your maximal speeding, your maximal speeding you have here. And if you want to reach the maximal speeding, you go fast, but then your function gets high. But your function cannot go too far because you have the limitation. So you have to rotate. But because you have to rotate, you are controlled once again by the second derivative. So this periodic function, like hill up, hill down, is the natural, na natural like test if if your estimate is working or not. Like the first derivative controlled by the second in the function itself. And all co of course we can generate to the higher derivative. So uh, why is it called Galliardo Nirenberg? That's actually kind of uh, problematic because when you say Galliardo Nirenberg inequality and you ask 10 mathematician, you would get 10 different formulas. So uh, from the history of like the interpolation, interpolation inequalities in, in this form, first one was the Landau. Uh, this year is like approximation because I have sent 12, 13 and 14. And he, he put here just the uh, L infinity spaces and he do it in line. And he has a very nice name to this to, to, to this to this paper because it's in German, but it's called like the uh, inequality for two times differentiable function, which is like exactly what it is in the paper. I will get to it soon. That this is important. But by the way, don't use Google Scholar to get your citation because it's written in German. And there is this like zweimal differentiable function von Edmund Landau. And if you put it, import it from Google Scholar, there would be Edmund von Landau because they recognize von. So they gave him the uh, Duke title many years after his death. W w maybe he deserved it. But ju just be careful with like <laughs> using the sources. Th then Kolmogorov uh, later uh, put it into the higher dimension still with uh, if infinity. And he also uh, optimized the constant, which is always bothersome in this, in the, in, in this kind of question. So uh, if, you, if you say landau kolmogorov inequality, that would be the galliardo nirenberg for uh, infinity spaces. And then there are two results in 1958. Uh, one is from Nash, D. Nash, and one is from uh, Olga Ladizhenskaya. Uh, exactly two because she have two papers like where for dimension two and dimension three. And these papers are not called some inequality or something like that because they, they use it uh, for their PDE 
to control to control the this term uh, and they use it in a form where uh, as I would write it this is J oh, sorry this is there is J there is K some alpha beta don't care they use it for j equal to zero and k equal to one so they more or less estimate the function itself by the function and its derivative it's working even this way and by the way this is the most attractive and most useful uh, version which i am not too familiar with i am you know, typically working with the one like the intermediate derivative and then finally, one year after, Galeardo and Nirenberg independently, they don't have any common paper, prove the general case uh, with this theta equal to j over k. When I go to the beginning with like inequality for two times differentiable function, it's the art of naming your article. Garia, Galeardo has a paper who first of all is in Italian and has Italian name. And its name is something, my Italian is not that good. Some other properties of the function of more variable. And Nirenberg has a paper, uh, or it's like lecture like notes, on elliptic PDE. And in this, they have this uh, splendid inequality. Nirenberg actually proved it where he used even the Helder spaces. And Galliardo actually do it, uh, and Nirenberg use it for whole space. And Galliardo write it, uh, basically, uh, he used there a cone condition to prove it that you can use it on the domain if you have the cone condition. And he established the cone condition in the previous paper, the functions of the, the, the properties of the function of more, more variable. Uh, so if we take the previous like classical result, which is pretty old, as you can see, uh, one more interesting thing they prove it independently and i have heard two stories how it comes that they do it like in the same year and one is that they met at the huge congress in edinburgh in 1958 and the other is that they meet in italy but like uh, it depends doesn't doesn't matter but they just met and they see that they have the same result as a as a, as a new result to present so they said, OK, we will cite, cite each other. But it's an important story to communicate, not to do the same thing. At least they do it the same year. So it's not like that they, they can claim I am the first and the, and the second. So first thing is, if you look at this, what spaces and what derivatives are allowed? The second question that you uh, naturally think can we replace, for example, L infinity term with something nicer, like, I don't know, BMO? Can, can we simplify or explain known results better? Uh, I have seen at least four reproofs, because sometimes it's written very hard. And if you have old papers and you have like the new, new theory, new tools, the proof can be much more shortened or much more like clearer. And, uh, also, can we transfer the philosophy of this inequality to the particular second settings for special applications? Because as you can see, controlling the first derivative or like the intermediate by the higher and by the function itself, it's pretty natural. And sometimes like this version is not the best we can we can get. And also there are plenty, plenty other things that you can do. You, you can search for best constant, you can ask for what it do in uh, different sets, which is actually pretty uncovered, pretty uncovered field. Uh, you can put it into uh, other than Euclidean space. So let me talk about optimality. Uh, if you have estimate where you have just two spaces, like the function controlled by derivative, it's pretty clear what is optimal. If we have this space, what we need to control it? Or if we have this control, what we know about space itself. But here we have three different letters, x, y, z. I put it big to signify that we 
don't have to bother with just lab experts. And the question is, if we know why Z, what is the best X we can get? So if we know the right hand side, what we can get on the left hand side? And the other, if we know X and one of the, the other one, what the other one has to be for this to be valid? Uh, in the, I would talk now, I would focus just on one functional spaces with fixed derivative and dimensions. Uh, ju ju just because there are too many parameters not to move with everything. This is very interesting because if you need something, you said, okay, I want to control in all spaces or I want to control with this. You look to the literature and there are plenty and plenty and plenty of papers where somebody said, okay, we can replace this term with this, we can replace this term with that. So when we come to the field, we were kind of unhappy about it. And we said, let's build it in a general way to cover as much as possible. Uh, so I will first start how to speak about the Lebec space in an optimal way, because this would be as our guideline to cover the general case. So we start in one dimension and we are using actually not that hard mathematics. We use covering, elder inequality and some other standard tools. It's year 1959. There are not even many tools we use are not even like defined yet. Then by induction, we can go to the higher di dimension and we can increase these derivatives to have this J and K as much uh, as high as we need. And then if we want to have this general theta, we just use the interpolation between the spaces when on one hand we have Sobolev space, uh, so, sorry, Sobolev inequality, on the other hand we have this J over K, Galeardonia mechanism. This is actually a pretty interesting question because you can say that my talk is lacking something, theorems. I don't write theorems. Why? Because just open Wikipedia and look at the Wikipedia what is the state of this original Galeardonia inequality. Because it's like, just the statement is <laughs> The trouble is that if we have Sobolev inequality, we have this like P star. And this is for P being between one and N. And this is for N uh, sorry, for P bigger than N. And then you can ask, what is if P is equal to N? And this is a trap. <laughs> because you would get like, okay, this goes to infinity, this is infinity, so we are at infinity, it's cool. It's not cool, it's not infinity. So if you formulate the Galeardo Nirenberg, you have in a formulation set, it's valid everywhere, but if you step there, then you have problem. But then you can say, if you step there, but then you use the interpolation, you don't have like this, uh, that U infinity is bounded by. You don't have this. But you have, if, if, if you have, if you use BMO, then you, then you have it. And, uh, uh, sorry, it's not like the normal, it's like this This mean oscillation. So you, you can use this one instead for the interpolation. So you cannot use this one, you can use this one, but this one for the interpolation, if you are not at the endpoint, is still working, doesn't matter. I just want to emphasize that the original, original uh, result is kind of hard to written in a proper way. And then also, uh, I want to give credit to my friends and collaborators, uh, Philip Soutsky and also Nastya there. She's smiling if, I, if my glasses are working well. Uh, we have a paper about the interpolation between Helder and Lebesgue spaces because Nirenberg just didn't care. He said, okay, you can interpolate, but if you have there two, two Helder and one Lebesgue space, it wasn't dealt, done till we done it. So uh, he claimed a lot of things proof a little bit, but all his claims are 
kind of true soul, and he is Nirenberg, so who can judge him? And then, if we want to check optimality in the classical Lebesgue scale, uh, classical Lebesgue case, the scaling is enough. In the same way as in the symbol of inequality, you just delay, you just delay, and you can see that this is exactly the one you can get. How many? How much time do I do I have? Fifteen minutes. Okay, I will speed up. If you want to transfer to the Banach functional spaces, it's kind of uh, like crazy. First of all, scaling is not enough. Scaling C only part of it. And in the original proof, we need Helder, we need Helder inequality. So here we can have the Helder factorization of spaces, which is uh, like standard, st st standard Banach functional spaces tool. And basically, we say that we can get some like the factorization space if Helder inequality holds. Uh, just this version would give you the uh, average scale result of Galea, uh, the Nirenberg inequality, which was actually proven first in a special case and our gen general proof covers it also. But then there is like the other version of the Helder inequality done by the calderon lozanovsky construction which is slightly like finer. People in Banach functional spaces said, no, it's dramatically finer, but uh, it works for even for Lorentz scale in a per perfect way. And we also know, uh, need alpha convexification of spaces. And there is a crucial tool that we can use to work and to provide all Banach functional spaces x, y, z, and to check if it's valid. And it's like the pointwise point -wise inequality by Kalamajska, independently later by Mazia and Shaposhnikova. Basically, in this field, everything was proved at least twice, and then Otto's map, it's some curse of this field. This is pointwise inequality. There is no norm. This is very, very important and very, very useful. And you can estimate in a similar way if you take maximal operator on the right hand side separately for the higher derivative and separately for the for the function itself. And I would sketch you the proof how to do it. It's actually just one slide. If we have this pointwise inequality, we just put it in the norm of x. And if we have the Helder inequality, either provided by Helder factorization or by this calderon lozanovsky inequality, we can split it into two norms, then we use alpha convexification to split it. And then there is this, this like crazy last inequality where we erase big M. And this is actually the question, because if we have just this estimated by this, it's perfect case. But there are the cases where we cannot erase the M. We can erase the M only if the maximum operator is bounded. Uh, in the spaces Z and Y. So there is the question uh, that it's equivalent to, 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 to the estimate of the Boyd index. You are familiar with this. And there is the big question. If we are covered, if we, if we what we have covered and what we didn't cover. And the problem is at the end point because in L1 and the spaces that are very close to L1, like Lorentz, Lorentz spaces or like these are defined spaces. The maximum operator is not bounded. So we cannot, cannot just erase M and we would get some weaker. So we want to evade this problem. And one idea is to have a better pointwise estimate. But if you just draw this, you will see you have no nothing better. Because this is like an natural country example where you can show that. Uh, you cannot imp improve the original point-wise point -wise estimate to cover this. And uh, covering this case is still in progress. I wouldn't spoil it to you. But as, if, as we know that for L1 it's working, and for indices bigger than one it's working, it would be crazy if this case isn't covered. We cannot prove it, but it would be crazy. And uh, just just to give you some view where, where you can look elsewhere. Uh, 
fractional derivatives is a huge thing here. And even Nirenberg in his original paper said, okay, I will prove it only for like the integers, but for a fraction it's okay too. And uh, like the big names, like Rezis, Van Schaftig, and Jung, Mernescu, and Figali, they are involved in this fractional, fractional, fractional spaces cases, and you can go through the literature there. And there are other nonlinear versions. Uh, first of all, we can consider like weighted spaces or Sobolev column spaces, or basically anything where you estimate in this philosophy. And also, there are some like totally nonlinear version where you have some functional where you put the second derivative and the function itself, and you get some control over over the norm of the first derivative. And this is the, my last slide. How much time do I have? Still 10 minutes. I speed up too much, but uh, I have the best part here, uh, the coffee break. So <laughs> thank you for your attention.